Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 738 of the podcast, and it is Saturday the 17th of February 2024 as I record this. In today's show, I have an interview on writing craft and creative mindset, as I discuss the hard joy of writing with two co-authors, Sharon Fagan McDermott and MC Benedictson. And I rarely do these three-way conversations, (laughs) so I think you're going to enjoy it. We talk about why we find joy in the work of writing, regardless of the outcome, writing metaphor and sense of place, why jealousy is completely normal and how to reframe it in a positive way, and the benefits and challenges of co-writing. This focus on the process is so important and reminded me of a quote from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. You have the right to work, but for the work's sake only. You have no right to the fruits of the work. Desire for the fruits of work must never be your motive in working. And that's so important for writers. And Stephen Pressfield quotes that also in his book, Do the Work. And I always love to come back to that. Um, And I was thinking about it at the moment because I'm deep into first draft writing. And, you know, it is digging stuff out of yourself. And that work is why we love to do this, I guess. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing things this week, well, there was a bit of a kerfuffle, let's call it that, over Find Away Voices by Spotify's new terms of service, with language that many interpreted as a rights grab. Now, it was it's pretty good to know that as a collective, independent authors can make such a noise that a company will listen. And authors did make a noise, and within 24 hours, Find Away emailed to say they were reviewing the terms based on feedback. And then just this morning, as I record this, they sent out revised terms with clarification and a blog post clarifying everything. They said, to be clear, we will not use your content to create a new book, ebook or audiobook without your permission, provide access to your audiobook without paying you royalties, or use your content to create a new AI voice without your permission. So that is a good outcome and uh, good to know that by making a noise, some companies will listen. So Orna Ross has a solo podcast episode on why Kickstarter is the most creative way to launch your book. And that is on the self-publishing advice podcast. She says, it's just so engaging and interesting when you're there. It's packed with amazing projects by amazing creatives. It's a creative space to hang out in. And that's one of the reasons I absolutely love it. And I love that too. And I shop so differently on Kickstarter. So people say to me, oh, well, you know, you can do it because you have an audience. It's fine for you. But I look at what I buy on Kickstarter and pretty much I've never heard of most of the people I back on Kickstarter. I'm not on their email list. I'm not in their community. And uh, I back campaigns sometimes with hundreds of dollars because I love the project. It is a completely different mindset to Amazon. And if you are considering doing Kickstarter, you have to think of it in a very, very different way. You have to think in this much more creative way about what you're offering potential readers who want to back creatives. It is it is just very, very different. I feel like people are conflating it as another sales platform, but it's not. It's entirely different. Uh, Orna also says, from a marketing perspective, and this is where I think it absolutely fire rockets your publishing, uh, is that it forces you to think creatively about your work. Your job as a creator on the platform is to excite and delight the readers and get them to become backers of your campaign. It puts you in the right place for thinking about marketing, which is thinking about the reader. The things that you have to put in place are things you need to put in place anyway if you're going to have a successful marketing strategy. 
And the thing is, if you don't do a Kickstarter or something similar around your launch, the temptation is to quietly just slip the book out and move on to the next one. And yes, I've definitely been guilty of that. And I am really glad that Kickstarter forces me to have a creative launch process. Uh, Orna goes into lots more detail, recommending a modest campaign to start and then building on that success. And that's what Paddy Finn and also Russell Nolte have said on the show. And I also have shared my lessons learned if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash sell direct resources, you'll find all the links there and the self-publishing advice podcast for Orna's episode. So Roz Morris had a great article on her site, Nail Your Novel, about why writing books is a career like no other and nine takeaways for doing it. Roz mentions her multiple streams of income as an author across multiple genres, an editor, writing coach, speaker, story consultant and ghostwriter. As she says, multiple jobs are the norm. Embrace diversification. It makes your core art possible. It will also make you a deeper human, more in touch with the world your readers live in. And I love this because so many people think, well, in fact, people have said to me, oh, well, you know, you're not a real writer because you don't spend 100% of your time writing. And I'm like, yeah, that's not actually the job of a writer. (laughs) It's only one part of what we do. So Roz goes through how she works and how the cycle of creation happens for her books. She does say, although the main job description is writing, a lot of the work is not writing. (laughs) She talks about the importance of networking, meeting different kinds of people and says, take very good care of your reputation. Find out what the best people do and aim for that. And I certainly agree with that, I think. Your reputation, your brand and being a professional is so important in the community. She also says, uh, she answers a question, do you see yourself retiring from this job? She says, no, this is a way of life. I have to create. It's how I fit into the universe. And I totally agree with this. And, uh, you know, I have on my wall, measure your life by what you create. And that's how I think too. And we all change and we pivot and the industry changes and technology changes. But I do think that every human has some default way of creating in the world. It might be physically through their hands, like sculptors or designers or their body, like dancers or musically or visually through painting or film. It might be coding or theoretically with like physicists and mathematicians and coders and or writing and we are writers we figure out what the hell we think through our words I mean I don't know what I think until I write about something and I kind of uh, write something and it, it appears in the world and it's some kind of magic so even if you choose to never publish another book you'll probably still write in a journal or jot down your thoughts or and use other people's words to inspire your own other forms of creativity. So I feel like we do, people listening, you are clearly writers first, and we can also meld that with different forms of creativity. But it's good to know. And I love to hear that from Roz. Now, Roz has been on the show multiple times talking about various craft topics, as well as writing literary fiction and travel memoir. And it's also a regular listener. So hi, Roz. (laughs) It is a great article. Link in the show notes as ever. So that's Nail Your Novel. This also leads me into another article from Johnny B. Truant, who many of you will remember from the self-publishing podcast a few years back. Johnny has a great Substack newsletter going and in his latest article he says, You are not what you used to be. Nothing is static. Everything changes, always. The question isn't if it'll happen. The question is whether we'll roll with the changes or hold stubbornly still and be run over by them. So that's a bit like the surf the wave, don't drown in it attitude. So Johnny uses his own journey with multiple pivots to illustrate what we all must go through individually. So if you've been wondering where the guys from SPP are, it's worth reading the article for for the backstory. But this also reflects what we must go through as an industry as well. So let's rephrase that line from Johnny. This is my rephrasing. The industry is not what it used to be. Nothing is static. Everything changes always. The question isn't if it'll happen. The question is whether we'll roll with the changes or hold stubbornly still and be run over by them. 
So yes, uh, that's if you go to Johnny B. Truant on Substack, you can read that. You are not what you used to be. Something to think about this week. How are you not what you used to be? So in terms of changes and surfing the wave of change, uh, several things have happened in the world of AI this week. The biggest thing is that OpenAI introduced the text-to-video model Sora, S-O-R-A, this week. And it is kind of gobsmacking. You have to go and have a look at openai.com forward slash Sora, S-O-R-A. Uh, if you're on any social media, you'll probably see some of these videos as well. Now, it's not open to the public right now, but it's in this kind of testing phase. But they say on the post... Sora is an AI model that can create realistic and imaginary scenes from text instructions. So yeah, text to video. It can generate videos up to a minute long, a minute long, this is just crazy, while maintaining visual quality and adherence to the user's prompt. The model has a deep understanding of language, enabling it to accurately interpret prompts and generate compelling characters that express vibrant emotions. Sora can also generate multiple shots within a single generated video that accurately persist characters and visual style. The model is also able to take a still image and generate a video from it, animating the image's contents with accuracy and attention to detail. It can also take an existing video and extend it to fill in missing frames. So... <laughs> This is funny because only, what, last month I made a book trailer for Beneath the Zoo with, uh, I used, what did I use, Dali for the images, which is the base model, one of their base models for images, uh, text to image. Um, and I also used ChatGPT to help me plan it and all of that kind of thing. And I did a video for how I made that for my patrons. And now I'm looking at this. So, and the finished book trailer is less than is around 30 seconds which is uh, about what you need for a, a book trailer really but now this says Sora can create multiple shots within a single generated video of up to a minute so <laughs> if you've been waiting to do a book trailer possibly just wait a bit longer <laughs> because <laughs> once this is available to the rest of us uh, I think that is going to enable us to do a lot of very creative video work now they are at the moment what they call red teaming it which is uh, testing it for to stop deep fakes misleading content um but yeah you need to look at this even if this scares you you need to look at it because it's it's very important to know what is possible with these tools so that you are not even if you don't want to use it yourself you need to know what is possible so you're not taken in by uh some of the things that are inevitably going to come out because remember even though some of these uh, like open ai and meta and people are going to put watermarks and things on there are a lot of open source tools that don't have that so i think the, and the other thing I was thinking is this might be the thing that enables me to do something like TikTok or do more Instagram reels or that kind of video that I just <laughs> don't want to do as me, the human. Now, you can also use this Sora, S-O-R-A, for still images. And so that will bring more competition to mid-journey in terms of, I use a lot of movie still images in uh, some of the stuff I'm doing, like my pitch package, which I'll talk about in a minute. So yes, big, very big week in AI. And what's so funny is when I heard about it and went and looked at the videos, I was kind of blown away. And then you get used to it very quickly. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to playing with that when it comes out. Uh, Gem uh, Google also is rolling out Gemini and in a blog post, CEO Sundar Pichai says Gemini is evolving and this was called Bard last year. Bard is now called Gemini. Uh, it, it supports an entire ecosystem and this is uh, Google's AI model. It supports uh, the products that billions of people use every day to so the APIs and platforms helping developers and businesses innovate. Gemini Advanced, which will probably be a subscription service like ChatGPT+, can be a personal tutor tailored to your learning style. It can be a creative partner, helping you plan content strategy, build a business plan, other things like that. So they're obviously rolling elements of this out to the various Google services. As um, Sundar Pichai says, it supports an entire ecosystem that billions of people use every day. So if you use any Google tools, uh, AI, Gemini will be the model that's rolling out there. 
I also thought I would do this very fun thing because, as ever, the pace of AI development is accelerating. But there is some really cool stuff that it's doing. I don't even touch on any of the medical stuff or the science stuff or just there's a lot going on. And I just mentioned things that are in uh, sort of our area. But this was very cool. The Vesuvius challenge. Now, I studied Latin and ancient Greek. I did classical civilization. I did the Bible or the New Testament in Greek at degree level. So, um, and I love AI. So this, this was catnip for me when they announced it. So here's what this is. 2000 years ago, a volcanic eruption buried an ancient library of papyrus scrolls now known as the Herculaneum papyri. In the 18th century, the scrolls were discovered. More than 800 of them are now stored in a library in Naples, Italy. These lumps of carbonised ash cannot be opened without severely damaging them. But how can we read them if they remain rolled up? So imagine these basically lumps of black material that have words on them from this 2,000-year-old library. So March 15th, 2023, so less than a year ago, The Vesuvius Challenge was launched to answer the question. Scrolls were imaged uh, at the particle accelerator in Oxford and the high resolution CT scans were released. A A global community of competitors and collaborators assembled to crack the problem with computer vision, machine learning, which is what we're calling AI now, and hard work. Less than a year later, in December 2023, they succeeded. The thoughts of our ancestors, locked in mud and ash for 2,000 years, hidden in darkness, now, with the light of a worldwide effort shining upon them, are finally seen again. So the prize is awarded. They can now read, I think it's something like 80% of the scrolls can be read with the way the, the models that they've built. Uh, $700,000 awarded to a team of three. And I loved seeing these three young people, these three extraordinary young people, uh, you know, in their 20s, early 30s, using various AI tools to decipher the scrolls. And I, I write this kind of thing into my arcane thrillers. In fact, my last short story, Soldiers of God, kind of was was sparked by some of this scanning that goes on in the Vatican archives and an AI model that that uh, one of my characters Martin Klein uses discovers something and that sets them off on this uh, hunt for the the soldiers of God but this is I love this I just think it's wonderful so when (laughs) if you're like oh I'm so worried also think about all the wonderful things that are happening and uh, yeah there's a lot of positive news in AI that we need to think about and um, going back to Johnny's words there uh, you are not what you used to be and neither is the industry and in fact neither is the world (laughs) (laughs) things are changing. And so I'm going to keep trying to bring you the positive side of things. And the Vesuvius challenge is certainly one of that. One of those, you can go to scrollprize.org to read about that. So in personal news, I'm about 20,000 words into my first draft writing for Spear of Destiny, which I'm getting into more now. As I've mentioned many times, I'm a discovery writer, so I don't really know what's happening. And I'm kind of writing as I go and uh, writing a scene. And then I've been writing the scenes out of Vienna and then Nuremberg. So uh, Morgan and Jake are in Vienna. If you know my Arcane series, they're in Vienna. Spear of Destiny from the Vienna uh, Treasury uh, is is stolen and that kind of sets off the adventure. <laughs> and I put various aspects of Vienna in and then also the Nuremberg bunker is in there. I've written that scene. I'm loving the research side. I'm doing a lot of Nazi occult research, which is a lot of fun. Uh, the Kickstarter pre-launch page is up so you can see the cover jfpen.com forward slash destiny and I will be writing uh, some of the scenes there's also going to be stuff in Tibet there'll be things in Washington DC and uh, some other things and the Washington DC trip that I did uh, a year ago uh, will be featuring there as research too so I also sent out the newly uh, fully rewritten author blueprint to my email list. You can get that free ebook if you sign up at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. I have also been wanting to play with Eleven Labs for the AI audio and I did make a voice clone, but I didn't like it. 
it was too uncanny valley. And so at the moment, I am still keeping my human voice as my human voice. (laughs) But then I did make an audio version with another voice, which I kind of quite liked. But then I realised that given that the author blueprint may well be my last word on books for authors, at least for now, I might just record it myself. Um, I'm getting a print edition done as well. This is like a short book. It's around sort of 30,000 words on writing, publishing, book marketing, making a living, AI. It's kind of everything. So I want to do it justice. I didn't really expect it to be like a whole nother book, given that I said I was pivoting away from writing books as Joanna Penn. (laughs) But this is essentially another book as Joanna Penn. So yes, if you're on my list, you should have access to that. And uh, if not, you can join the creativepen.com forward slash blueprint. Also, very exciting. I am thrilled to be on the shortlist for the Selfie Awards, which are uh, UK book awards for the best indie published books in three categories, fiction, children's books and general non-fiction, which is the one I'm in, I'm shortlisted for Pilgrimage, my travel memoir on lessons learned from solo walking three ancient ways. The winners will be announced at London Book Fair on Tuesday 12th of March 2024. I will be there. (laughs) Fingers crossed. Now I am at this point multi-award nominated as JF Penn. I have won awards for podcasting, several awards, and I've also won awards for being a creative entrepreneur as Joanna Penn. But I have not won an award for any of my books as yet. So it would mean a lot if I won this award. And of course, there are lots of awards out there, but this is one that I actually rate. (laughs) So (laughs) I would like to win. Um, And here is a tip. If you want to win an award, I haven't won it yet, obviously, but you have to enter an award in order to be shortlisted and potentially win it. So I will link to this at bookbrunch.co.uk. There's a list of the, well, the shortlist. So yeah, if you want to win an award or at least be shortlisted, you have to enter them. And it is worth keeping an eye on the awards you consider worth entering. Also, I guess another tip here is if you want to be good at something, you have to practice. Now, last week, I mentioned that I'm intending to push my comfort zone and pitch Catacomb, which is horror action, horror action thriller at London Screenwriters Festival in April. And this week I had a practice pitch session with an industry professional. So I basically paid for an hour's consulting. And before even saying anything at all, uh, I said kind of hello And then I did the practice pitch. So I went straight into it. This person did not know what I was going to pitch. I pitched for seven minutes. My pitch is probably too long, but I was so nervous. I was sweating. My heart was racing. It was ridiculous. I was so nervous. And then he gave me some feedback and it went really well. And I am very, very encouraged because I proved to myself that I can do it. I also, he said my pitch deck was actually pretty good. And I have some notes to incorporate into that. I am planning on recording the pitch for my patrons once I've made the changes. The deck itself might be useful for people to see what kind of thing to do if you want to pitch your project. I also use mid-journey images as part of it and I will share those with the prompts. So yes, it's been a very positive personal week and I feel like all of those things are JF Penn development. Well, most of those things are JF Penn developments. So very happy with that. So thanks for your emails and comments this week. So Monica said, what a great question you posed for us this week. And this was around how do you push yourself out of your comfort zone? Uh, Monica says, I always admire how much you put yourself in situations out of your comfort zone. (laughs) But now you've asked us what we're going to do. It made me realise how rarely I do that. I don't even have an answer yet, but I will be considering this question. It disturbs me a bit to realise how rarely I challenge myself this way. Must be remedied. And Monica, you know, now I'm going to challenge you. (laughs) Have you decided how you're going to do that yet? This is a week later. Also, on the interview with Jeff around writing and producing an independent film, uh, Adele Celeste said on YouTube, long time listener here since 2014. Wow, as a decade, a decade listener, Adele. Thank you so much. Uh, She says, I'm an actress and a filmmaker as well. 
This past year, I joined a faith-based film club that was formed in my area. We made a micro-budget film. It's around a 30k budget. The director wrote the screenplay. I'm the publicity and marketing coordinator and help with fundraising. I'm excited to fill these roles and get experience. That sounds great. I mean, that's definitely micro-budget. Um, and yeah, I mean, getting the experience and then kind of leveling up to the next thing. This this kind of fits back with the Kickstarter stuff, which is you don't need to aim for thirty thousand dollars or any of that kind of thing. You can just aim for five hundred dollars on your first Kickstarter. In the same way, with your first micro budget film, thirty k is a small budget for for a film. So yeah, this is this is the way we have to think. It's like you don't just go from zero to massive in whatever it is. This is the myth of publishing that the first book gets a multi seven figure deal. That might happen very rarely, and that's what gets reported in the news. But that is not the reality for most people. A prolific author also on YouTube said, I'm on the third episode of the zombie show that I wrote, produced and starred in. The first episode is going to be 10. Oh, the first season is going to be 10 episodes. My next project will be a film. And again, brilliant way to get started because you can write, produce and star in a podcast uh, fiction that then you could use as potentially the basis of a script for the next project. So let's think that way. Let's always think like we're going to build on our experience over time. So as ever, please leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me and also send me pictures of where you're listening. Joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. But as ever, please don't message me on social media as I am almost entirely off it. <laughs> So this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Did you know you can publish an audiobook right in your Kobo Writing Life account? It's as easy as publishing an ebook. You can create a customizable table of contents, set the price in 16 different currencies and even set up a pre-order for your audiobook with no date limitation. You can also add your audiobook to Kobo Plus, Kobo's non-exclusive subscription platform. There are also lots of promotional opportunities for audiobooks published through Kobo Writing Life. They even have customizable social assets that you can download to share on Facebook, Twitter or X and Instagram making it easier for you to reach this growing market. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the audiobooks tab or the promotional mailing list, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and they will sort it out. Don't forget you can purchase audiobooks at kobo.com and they will download directly to your free Kobo app or e-reader. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you get your shows, including this one, and find them on social media. Create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my community at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to the 17 new patrons who've joined since last week. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting for months and years. You are amazing. This week, I put up on the community a craft video uh, around uh, writing fiction. And if you join the community, you get all the backlist videos and audio. And there are now lots of AI demos and uh, tutorials and also the monthly Q&A where I answer your questions, which is like an extra solo show a month, around 45 minutes of me answering questions. You also get the backlist of many more Q&A episodes. The Patreon is now a monthly subscription the equivalent of a black coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. So come on over and join more than a thousand authors if you get value from this show and you want more. Thanks to everyone again and join us at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Sharon Fagan McDermott is an award-winning poet, musician and a teacher of literature. M.C. Benedictson is an award-winning author, freelance editor and writing coach. 
Together, they are the co-authors of Millions of Sons on Writing and Life, which we're talking about today. So welcome to the show, Sharon and Christine. Thank you so much. We're so glad to be here. We are so glad to be here. Thank you, Joe. So we're going to get straight into the book. You talk about the power, the play, the joy of writing. And it's interesting because sometimes I feel like that play and that joy are lost in the discussions around publishing and the business of books. And this show is as guilty as any around that. So I wondered if we could start by talking about what are your tips for finding play and joy in the work itself, especially if authors are feeling that that is lost. Yeah, absolutely. So this is Christine. Um, Sharon and I actually met and became friends under very stressful circumstances. We we're both upper school English teachers at the same school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And teaching is one of those jobs, like publishing, that asks a lot of you, right? There's a lot of little details to keep track of. It's emotionally intense. You're facing months on end of relentless deadlines, right? Sound familiar? Um, And many days, Sharon and I ended up side by side in our office, uh, looking and and feeling a bit like dish rags, just kind of like limp and dripping. But in those moments, and this is part of why we became such good friends, we would play together. One of us would start a joke about like how we wished we were ambidextrous because then we could grade twice as fast. And then the other one would suggest like writing with our toes and we'd consider a pen in the mouth and we'd go on and on and laugh ourselves silly. And and we weren't playing in those moments because we had lots of free time and light hearts. We were playing because we needed it. It was a way to name the absurdity of the situation and take a little bit of control back. And I think that's very often the case with playfulness and joy. These things are a necessity, not a luxury. The book was actually written in the early days of the pandemic. And both Sharon and I, for different health reasons, have to be very cautious about COVID. So we went into intense isolation and the writing was a joy to us. It sustained us, but it was a deep hard joy that we kind of had to mine out of ourselves, not because we were living the good life, but because we needed it to survive. I think joy is this kind of radical act of resistance and play too. You asked about the pressures of publishing, and I think that that fits right in here, right? Like that it can be incredibly hard to keep the joy and playfulness of writing front and center because publishing takes time. It takes attention. It's emotionally exhausting at times. um, And there's periods when it can really take over your writing life. But I would say there are a couple of things to do to protect your joy in writing. One is to involve someone else, preferably someone who's committed to celebrating your work. Having Sharon on the other side of the porch, reading her essay drafts to me, listening to mine, made it feel a lot more like play because we were tossing ideas back and forth and delighting in little turns of phrase and asking questions, being in it together. So I think find someone who will play with you is really important. And the other one is to really put a value on your joy. It's a harsh reality that time is finite. And when you're working on the business side of publishing, it does cut into your writing time, period. So have some grace, right? Grace with yourself to like, don't beat yourself up if you didn't hit your thousand words a day or whatever your goal is. Keep in mind that the joy that you have in your writing is perhaps the most important resource for your writing career. So you have to nurture it. You have to prioritize it. Even if it feels like you should be doing these other things, Do the kinds and the parts of writing that you love, not just because it's good for your writing career, but it is, right? It is also because it's going to give you the tools to survive on the planet as a playful, joyful person. But if you want to talk in purely business terms, your writing career does depend on your willingness to keep writing. So feed the joy and it will pay you back. I agree with Christine when she says pick the right person that you're going to be working with (laughs) because the two of us knew each other so well and knew each other's sense of humor. And that sense of humor gets us through a lot of things. I'm a poet. I usually write by myself. I'm not someone who can write out in coffee shops or other places with other people. I really need quiet and alone time to do that. 
But as we, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true. It can be very lonely to write sometimes, especially if you're doing material that might be slightly darker or delving into things you haven't delved into before. So this was a new occasion for me working with Christine. This, the kind of joy that came from the spontaneity, that back and forth banter, that knowing that somebody was on the other side of this, who... And I should say this, Joe, we made a pact with each other. We were not going to critique each other, which I know is unusual, but we trusted each other's writing process. We trusted each other's skills. That's why I asked Christine to do this project with me. And in so trusting, we felt like we could do our own revisions. We didn't need to be each other's editors. That wasn't what we were there for. We were there to kind of inspire and support and uplift one another. And that's exactly what happened. I don't mean to sound Pollyanna-ish, but it truly is what happened. It was probably my favorite writing experience of my life, to be honest with you. Oh, well, that's interesting. You mentioned that you do most of your creation alone, and that is going to be the reality for most people listening. So what are your thoughts on finding that hard joy, I guess, as Christine mentioned before? How do we find the joy if we're writing alone and we don't have that person who we're laughing with every day? How do you do it? I I love that question, Jo. Um, So sadly, I have just returned from a younger sister's funeral, and that just was this past weekend. And I know I will be writing about her, and sure, that doesn't sound like anything that anybody would want to delve back into, going through grief and sorrow about losing someone you love. But for me, and this happened at a very young age, I think because I had an Irish grandfather who was always reciting poetry, and he was very playful about language. He would let me take a Yeats line, for instance, and let me kind of mimic it and then rhyme it, and he would laugh and support that kind of play with language. He didn't treat it as precious stuff in that way. And I think writing alone and needing the silence I'm still amusing myself on the one hand by the malleability of language, the flexibility of it, the be- the play that I can do with my words. But also, I think, and this is a little bit deeper, I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but I think when you hit something like grief and something that feels chaotic and uncontrollable, There is something quite beautiful about being able to order something on a page, even if it's just words, right? Words can't bring the dead back. They can't bring the loved one to your door again. But maybe I can take some of that grief that can feel so chaotic sometimes and make a purer order of it on the page while working in this medium that I love so much. I actually really love words. And I think that brings me comfort no matter what. I think that's great. And I love this phrase that Christine used, I guess, this hard joy. And talking there about the difficulty in writing, and I'm so sorry about your sister, Sharon. I have two younger sisters, so I I feel some empathy there. And the part of the reason we are writers is because it's the way we figure out things in our lives and on the page and try and communicate them to other people. And I feel like sometimes people think, oh, if it's not coming easy, then I'm a bad writer or I'm not in some magic flow state. But this is hard work. And I like this idea of finding pleasure in the work, understanding that it is work. And yet this is what we love to do, I think. I think that's what I was trying to to get to in that. And I would say like, I believe that it's a misunderstanding to say that play is easy. If you ever watch children play, they work at it, right? Like it is, you watch a baby sitting on the ground with its blocks and it is thinking and it is working and it is trying and it is going through multiple iterations of can I build this tower and knock it down? And how does gravity work? And all of these things, they they are working hard at play. And I don't think that the best kinds of play are simple and easy. They are the things that take work. But the reward is profound when we surrender ourselves to that hard work of play and the hard work of joy as well. 
Fantastic. Now, in the book, you have a great chapter on metaphor. And in fact, we had one earlier, you talked about being wrung out like a dish rag at the school teaching. So there's a metaphor that people can picture in their heads. But how can we use metaphor effectively to elevate or deepen our writing, but also avoid hammering people over the head with it? And also, I guess, be more original with our metaphors. So... Last night, the Grammy Awards were shown on the television, and everybody throws around the word star. And that's where I want to begin, because, of course, that's also a metaphor. But one of the things I love about it is that we don't think a lot about what we mean when we say star. When we say star, we just think of whatever the musician is that we might be complimenting at that point. But really, we're evoking the cosmos, right? We're evoking things that are above us and out of our grasp and out of reach, and they're distant and mysterious, and they're sparkly and shiny, right? All of this is embedded in that metaphor star. And the deeper you dig into the metaphor you choose to use, the more layers get peeled back. And I find that process very exciting. I kind of love that. It allows us to invoke things in a short amount of time. And in poetry in particular, it becomes very important to be concise. That economy of language um, has to say a lot in a little space. And metaphor is one thing that allows that. It's a vehicle that allows that. And I think also a good metaphor can conquer concretize something, make that elusiveness of emotional experience a little bit more specific to the human being as opposed to a Hallmark card kind of up in the ether and talking in generalities. So the metaphor can kind of put a pinpoint on it, I I guess, is what I want to say. You know, our language is used for tax documents and wills and grocery lists and all kinds of things. And also, there's something about metaphor, I think, that used well can elevate the language. And I like that, too. I do like that the language is taken a little bit out of the normal and the everyday. I know that goes against some of what is being written now. I think a lot of people embrace conversational language and everyday language, and I applaud that, and a lot of people do it very well. But I still like a really good metaphor that can show you the reach and the breadth of our world, right? A glass may be a glass, but it might also be a shining star, right? I I like that it can push our imagination into new places. And I would say it does need to be used sparingly. Too many metaphors start feeling overwrought. That's where that whole word pretentious starts being tossed around if people find that they're running into metaphor and not enough straightforward language. So I would say a good metaphor comes in most handy when you're trying to make grounded the ineffable, right? You want to really share with somebody, uh, I really was feeling this thing, boy, it's hard to talk about. I really don't know how to articulate it. It's kind of like, and then you go into your simile or metaphor to give it a little bit more body. And finally, we have a prompt in that chapter you talked about in Millions of Sons, in the metaphor chapter, which honestly gives a step-by-step way of generating metaphor, which basically is based on almost sitting wherever you are. And a metaphor can be literally anything. I can say, love is the dusty old guitar sitting in my room right now. And then I say that out loud and my mind goes, well, what does that mean? What does it mean that love is a dusty old guitar? And I take it from there. You know, guitars have bridges and they have frets. When I start pulling apart both the concrete item and the possibilities inherent in what I just said. And that's a form of play, too. We were talking about play earlier, and I kind of love that moment of play. But that's, I think, where I get a lot of fresher metaphors from are just my everyday world. I look very closely at a a doorknob or a keyhole or a jacket, and you call it some kind of more generalized thing. Anger is a purple velvet jacket. Well, what the heck does that mean? At first, it makes no sense to us. But if you really tweak and work with a good metaphor, you can mine a lot from the language in that way. 
I love those examples. I love the dusty old guitar. And actually, it's really interesting because as soon as you say dusty old guitar, then I get a sense of place. And I use sense of place a lot in my fiction and my memoir. And I appreciated that you have a chapter on place. So how can we bring a place alive in a reader's mind? And why is that so important? The the how of place is really interesting. And I'm going to touch back to something I talk about in my essay on imagery, because the temptation as writers, when we have invested in a place, right, and it has knit its way into us, or it's an imagined place, and we have invested all of this meaning in that place, the temptation, because we have the language resources to do so, and the imaginative resources to do so, is to describe it in exhaustive detail. I am have it so firmly in my mind that I can describe every nitty gritty piece and element of it for you. I could tell you about the dust on your shoes as you walk up the gravel driveway. I can give you the itch of sweat on your shins. I can give you the killdeer's nest and the sound of the katydids in the hayfield. I could crawl over that place, the smells and the sensations until my reader if they're patient enough, is standing exactly where I am. They feel everything I I feel. But that's the kicker. We are always at the mercy of our reader's patience. So if a detail isn't doing something, if it doesn't carry some spark of energy that's going to kind of move forward in the prose, then it is our obligation as the curators of our own words to weed it out. We have to say, okay, everything that is here that helps to build this place has to be doing something, even if we cherish it, even if we find it moving and evocative. Now, doing something doesn't just mean plot. Establishing a sense of place is emotional work. It's atmospheric, and that can be important. So setting a tone is work. It doesn't just have to be, okay, someone's going to use this leaf, therefore I'm going to talk about the leaf. It can come from the connotations of specific words you're using, you know, the difference between sweltering heat and golden sunshine. But once you've hit that tone, then move on so that you don't depend upon the patience of your reader to to give every detail. And also keep in mind that it doesn't have to happen all at once. I I do think that place can be unveiled rather like a a character in in glimpses that the reader pieces together into the whole. And and so I do think that there's, there is the impulse to have it all, to say it all, to give it all because I have it, that needs to be balanced and tempered somewhat with restraint so that we have some discovery of the place as well as our characters and themes, everything else we're trying to put into our writing. Mm, And everything else is often (laughs) difficult because there's always so much, but also the, I guess, the character point of view for that. So coming back to Sharon's dusty old guitar, the point of view of the character who is noticing that and who uses that metaphor is going to change so much about the story, Mm. as in, is it a grandchild discovering the dusty old guitar of the dead grandfather, for example, or who else could it be? And that will change the description of the setting. So Sharon, do you have any other sort of bits to add on setting? Place is really important to me just as a person. I like to be grounded. I like to know where I am. I believe very much in something Ralph Waldo Emerson talked about a long time ago. He said, why are we always going everywhere at such a pace? Why don't we just learn to know our own backyards? And I I wasn't deliberately doing this, but I kind of live that way. I'm very interested in the local. And as an environmentalist, I think that also is influencing me, right? Because if I care about the local, I actually have the power to do something about the local. So that's more just on a, a personal level. But when I talk to my students about place, I kind of joke with them and I say, look, In your lovely story, you keep saying city, 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 but London is not Pittsburgh, is not Singapore, is not San Francisco. These are very, very specific, different cities with different histories, different neighborhoods, different ways of being. And it matters. It matters if you're shaping a character on the page. You know, how are they being shaped by the place in which they live? 
So I, I do, I push my students a lot in terms of naming things. Give me a street name once in a while, if it's important to the story. I don't mean you have to name every single street the character is on, but if it's a key moment, yes, the names matter. I think they make a difference. I think they ground the reader. And I think that they make us feel like we are a uh, part of the larger neighborhood that's being described there. And it also just in real life makes us have a stake in what's happening there. It's hard to care as much. It doesn't mean we don't, but about things that happen a zillion miles away. I know the internet demands that we care about everything and every part of the world at all times, but I don't think humans are wired to be able to do that. I think we are wired to to love a place and to love the people in that place. And yes, to have compassion for others, of course, but place, I think, allows us to empower ourselves to do something. So I didn't talk as much about writing there, maybe, as you would have liked, Joe, but I think place is just a very personal thing to me. It matters. I, I said to my students once, you would care about naming place if you had been standing where I was above the Mississippi River once where there was a big sign right in the grass that I was in that said, beware of poisonous snakes. And boy, did I care <laughs> about place at that moment. And I screamed and I ran and that was that. But I said place actually makes a big difference in how we feel, who we are and how we're shaped. I really love that. And I agree with you. And obviously, the character of the person who sees the snake sign and runs away is different to the person who sees the snake sign and kind of goes, oh, snakes. I'm that person, actually. I really, <laughs> I really <laughs> love snakes. <laughs> so, love and I wrote a whole book, End of Days, which is all about a lot of different snakes. But yes, yeah, so I want to come back to the book, because as well as the craft side, you also have chapters on more of the writing life. And Christine, you have a wonderful section on jealousy and ambition, which I feel is so often glossed over because we're like, oh, I would never feel that because that's just not me. And like, it's not acceptable to necessarily talk about jealousy. So I really appreciated that. So can you talk about the kinds of jealousy that authors inevitably face and perhaps how we can admit it, but also sp spin it in a positive way? And, and this was a hard essay for me to write. I don't want people to know how petty I am, but I did write it and I, I sent it out and I included it in this book because as you say, I, I think this is something we need to talk about. Just denying it or asking people to, to just stuff it, that's not the way to get through. I've always been a competitive person, but I really don't like how it feels. I get very judgmental about myself and about other people. It's always easier and somewhat more in keeping with my Mennonite upbringing to put aside ambition. So if I don't try to win, then there's no shame if I don't. As a young adult, I really did. I tried to convince myself that my calling was only to teach literature, not to write it. So the fact that my poems and stories were locked away, unread, that wouldn't be a failure. And that worked for a little while. I, I had a few flirtations with publication, but I really didn't allow myself to hope for anything on more than that until... 2019, when I quit my job as a classroom teacher, and I didn't have a real plan to that, like, I am going to go and become a writer. But it just bubbled up, I, I realized that at, when I did that self reflection and asked, what do I really want to do next? Yeah, I wanted to publish, I wanted to write things that other people would read. And that's when the jealousy came in hand in hand with my ambition. Other people, I could see them, right? The more I was getting into to publishing, I could see other people succeeding, doing the thing that I wanted to do. And so I was constantly comparing myself to others and not very generously, either to myself or to my fellow writers. Now, of course, I can pull myself out of that mindset. It's not like I can only feel jealousy. I genuinely love to see other writers succeed, but that's not mutually exclusive. I can feel jealousy and feel joy at watching other people succeed. And I just have to acknowledge that the jealousy and the ambition are my little companions along for the ride. And as far as like how to do take a more positive spin, I think that's something 
that I'm still working out. I can say that receiving affirmation for my writing has helped. And I don't just mean like success, right? Having millions of sons published, of course, was hard evidence that I wasn't shut out of this path. And when I got the news that my novel, The Height of Land, which is coming out this fall, had won a contest that I had entered it in, I, I couldn't stop shaking with the joy of it. But as important as those achievements were, the thing, the affirmation that really settled some of that jealousy in me was hearing from readers, from people who had read my writing and were moved by it. That's what I needed. And that's because that's why I wanted to publish in the first place, to build that little bridge out of my mind to other people's. And hearing that readers had actually been able to cross that bridge settled something inside of me like nothing else did. And it, maybe that's the lesson, right? That we can be that voice of affirmation for one another. You can't do that for yourself, but we can listen to each other. We can respond to each other and prove to each other that the writing is working. So in terms of pulling oneself out of this, because I, I love that we're all admitting it, that we all feel this sometimes. But Sharon, it's interesting. I mean, poetry, you're, you're a poet. And I feel like even though sometimes Sometimes poets might not necessarily be the top of the charts, that poets might find that jealousy is just as bad as a poet as in the sort of best-selling thriller charts or whatever. So how do you deal with this and how can we pull ourselves out of jealousy to, I guess, reframe it in a more positive way? Well, you're absolutely right about that. And actually, I think when I was in graduate school as a poet, I was a little bit shocked to find out how jealous and yes, somehow how petty sometimes poets could be, including myself, when somebody else had a success that we were sort of longing for. And the success ranged, of course, right? When you're in graduate school, the success might be, I got a few poems taken in a journal, a known journal, right? And then it could build from there. But I think a couple of things happened for me. One is that I had some really good mentors. And they kind of just put things in perspective for me. And they said, yes, it's true. This person just got this award slash uh, publication that you wanted. But first of all, ask yourself, how hard are you working for it? And the truth was there were times in graduate school, because I was a single mom, I wasn't able to put all that much energy into kind of trying to produce and to get published. And then there were other times I could. So that was helpful just to kind of sit back with myself and say, you know, this person just got that, but they send things out every week. You're not doing that. That was one thing that was a little bit helpful just to give me a perspective. But I think the other thing was, I it took me a long time to realize this, but there's a million voices in the world, right? There are so many writers out there and there's so many poets out there. And there seems somehow to be room for all of us. If we do the work and we show up and we continue to put effort out toward getting ourselves published, I do believe that sooner or later, something will happen. Will we all reach, like Mary Oliver was the goddess poet here in America and mm. Um, I adore her too, but am I going to reach Mary Oliver's status? No, I know that I won't. And I'm okay with that. I think growing older also helps. I'm older than Christine, and I think growing older has tempered some of that for me. When I was in the university teaching at the University of Pittsburgh, it was very competitive there. So you were picking up on some of that too. And the competition was really the more books you had, the more likely you would get a tenure track position was the going saying. Well, it turned out I didn't want a tenure track position. (laughs) And I suddenly thought, just keep moving forward. The work makes you happy. You love to write. You've always loved to write. And in fact, I experimented for a year not writing and I was miserable, miserable, because I thought maybe I could walk away from it, that it was just more than I could do. And I was miserable without it. So I'd say, ask yourself, am I doing the work? I think that's just a nice practical thing to ask yourself. Like, this person I'm jealous of, have they been working that much harder at it, maybe? Right? Putting more Mm -hmm. out there. That was helpful for me, just from my point of view. 
And just that, kind of, for me, it's always about the work. Um, Christine said something about publishing Millions of Sons. I was so thrilled when that book came out, when it was accepted and came out, and we loved our book launch. We had a great old time, packed house, lovely response from people. But, you know, at this point, my brain is just wants to move forward. It's not that I'm dropping Millions of Sons. I adore that book, and I'm proud of it. But I love to write. And so my mind is already like, okay, what's the next project? What are we doing next? Where are we digging in next? That is not to say I don't still get jealous sometimes. I absolutely do. I just think the older I've gotten, that that's kind of dimmed a little bit for me. And now I'm more about use your time wisely and get the work done. Yeah, I love that you said the work makes you happy because that is the point. And this is what I focus on too. And I was laughing because I'm the same as you. I always just want to move on to the next project. I'm like, yep, that one's done. Let's just keep (laughs) writing because I love creating new things in the world. And the thing that's already out there is not the new thing. So let's just move on the next project and write. (laughs) And so it's lovely that we can all find solace in the work as such. Right. So we talked a lot about what's in the book, but of course, many people listening are considering co-writing. I've co-written a few books myself and I found it very, very hard. (laughs) So I wondered if you could maybe talk about, from each of your perspectives, a a benefit of co-writing, but also perhaps a challenge of co-writing. So I'm going to use a word that isn't very popular nowadays, but the reason that I asked Christine to work with me came purely out of my intuition. I have very strong intuition about certain things regarding my writing. And I was leading a creative writing workshop during COVID. And Christine was one of the members of it. There was about 10 of us and it was wonderful. It went on for a year and a half. It was on Zoom, of course, we weren't meeting in person. And one night, I just had this very strong feeling to ask Christine to write a book with me. I had no idea what I was asking. I didn't know what the book was or what we were going to write. I just wanted to do it. And I asked her after Zoom that night. She stayed after and I asked her and she said an immediate yes. And we went from there. But I think that, I think I mentioned this earlier in the broadcast that I just knew she was the right person to do it with. I have worked with brilliant writers. Uh, Terrence Hayes was one of my friends in graduate school. He's a superstar poet now and has won all kinds of major awards, including the National Book Award. And I never would have thought to ask him to do it with me. There there are certain personalities that you love and they spark you and they inspire you, but they might not be the right ones to get down into the nitty gritty with. Christine, I knew that we could make it through challenges, hard times, good times, because we had a good sense of humor. We listened well to each other. We respected each other. I really respect her as a writer, and I really respect her insight into writing. And also, we have different personalities. Christine is much more patient than I am. Christine is much more practical-minded than I am. I'm sort of a romantic. I'm up in the ether sometimes, and Christine has a fabulous way of grounding me. And I think those kinds of differences in our personality became very useful as time went on. So when it came time for us to promote the book, it was so helpful to have the both of us because we have different connections. We have different opinions. We have different skill sets. And so, you know, now on on social media, some of our audiences do have overlap because we live in the same city. We taught in the same school. So we talked together about like how we would roll out our announcements so that people who only knew one of us got all the necessary information. But if they knew both of us, it wouldn't become this totally redundant message that they hear 500 times a day. And that encouraged us to go really personal in how we talked about the book, which is appropriate for this book because it was really personal in its content. And so we got to talk about like what it meant for us to publish it, what it meant for us to appear in this place or this newsletter, whatever. We could really talk about what it meant to us. And I think that that brings people into that process with us and into the relationship between us as well. But then we have our different strengths, right? My husband's a filmmaker and I've learned some editing skills working with him. So he filmed a conversation with the two of us and I edited it into two promo videos that shared the anticipation of the release. We 
promote the book on both of our websites. Sharon was able to talk to the school where she and I met and talk about teaching the book in the upper school. And and so it's really just so helpful to have two people when you see each other as allies. And I think that's the thing. Of course, there's moments of conflict. We had different approaches to how we wanted to negotiate the contract, but we put the relationship first because we knew that's where the gold was. That's what was, was kind of paying our way forward was that we knew we wanted to do this together. And so that became the first priority. Well, the book is fantastic. It is Millions of Sons on Writing and Life. So tell us, where can people find you and your books online? All right. So you can find Sharon at SharonFaganMcDermott.com. I'm at BennerDixon.com. You can sign up for email newsletters for upcoming releases and so forth. You can also look us up on Twitter. I'm on Blue Sky, Instagram as well. And millions of sons can be found at book retailers like Bookshop and Amazon. But if you want to get it straight from the University of Michigan Press website, it's also orderable there or request it at your library. Fantastic. Well, it's been great to talk to you both. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. So I hope you found this episode interesting and that maybe you can notice where the hard joy is in your creative process in the week ahead. Or perhaps even you can acknowledge your professional jealousy and reframe it in a positive way. So let me know what you think of today's show. You can leave a message on the show notes at thecreativepen.com, leave a comment, sorry, uh, or on the YouTube channel. Or you can email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. Next week, I'm sharing a solo episode on writing a travel memoir. Since it is a year after my Kickstarter for Pilgrimage, I wanted to share the little audiobook I made as a stretch goal. I had thought that I would turn it into a bigger book at some point, but I'm now focusing on other projects as I've talked about, and I wanted to share it with you all. I cover the particular challenge of memoir, vulnerability and emotional honesty, how to capture your experiences, writing about real places and people as well as your own character arc, truth with a capital T versus truth with a small t, as well as how hard editing is with such a personal and often very long first draft, plus publishing choices and marketing for memoir. So that is coming up next week. And in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.